Good morning. Let's open in some prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for inviting us into your great adventure that you planned before the dawn of time. Thank you for entering this story you made, and thank you for living and suffering and dying for us on the cross. Thank you that you are our groom. Thank you for letting us be wed by Jesus. What an amazing relationship that is, Lord. Amen. So guys, you may know me as the director of financial aid, but that is not my calling. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. I'm what they call a cultural apologist. What does that mean to be a cultural apologist? Well, according to Dr. Paul Gould, this is working to establish the Christian voice, conscience, and imagination so that the gospel will be seen as reasonable and desirable. So the more we understand a culture, the more we can reach them, just like how a missionary learns the languages and cultures of where they serve. Nancy Piercy says, all Christians are called to be missionaries, responsible for learning the language of the society they are addressing. Within the boundaries of their native land, they may not face a literal language barrier, but they do face a worldview barrier as they seek to communicate with people whose thinking differs from their own. Well then, what is a worldview? A worldview is simply what we as individuals believe and hold to be true on how the world works. Everyone here in this world yearns to live in a complete and accurate worldview, but the world cannot do that on its own. Let's take a look at this brief video. I've been curious about this for a while. So if you go back, and here's a beautiful example to the 1920s, a young scientist by the name of Asa Schaefer asked a friend, could you put on a blindfold? I'm gonna take you to the edge of a field. And he said, what I'd like you to do is walk across this field in a straight line. Just stay as straight on course as you possibly can. So, the man headed off, and here is Asa's map of what happened next. The man starts to walk, and his route, as you see here, begins to tilt ever so slightly to the right. Now we're gonna speed this up just a bit. Notice that the blindfolded man now starts to turn dramatically, taking him back to the road where he started from, and then across the road, and then around again, and then back again, and around again, and increasingly he's moving in smaller curls until finally he hits a tree <coughs> and stops. All the while, he thought he was walking in a perfectly straight line. Strange? Well, there are many studies just like this. From 1928, here are three people who leave a barn on a very foggy day, and what they want to do is go to a point about a half mile away. Here's what happened, the map version. The barn is here, the destination is here. Now watch this, off they go. They think they're walking straight, but instead what they actually do is they start to turn and turn and turn and end up weirdly back at the very place where they started, the barn. This experiment has been done in all kinds of situations. Here's another 1928 study. A man is blindfolded and then asked to jump into a lake and swim in a straight line to the other side. Now here is where he swam. There is apparently a profound inability in humans to stick to a straight line when blindfolded or when there is no fixed point, no sun, no moon, no mountaintop to guide them. In this last case, a blindfolded man is asked to get into a car and is told to drive in a straight line across a totally empty Kansas field. Now the driver is not in any danger. All he has to do is hold course, but here is the map that shows what happened next. For 80 years, scientists have been trying to explain this tendency to turn when you think you're going straight. They thought maybe this is some form of handedness, like being a righty or a lefty, or maybe it's a right-left brain thing where one side of you is slightly dominant and then the dominance builds over time. Maybe it's just simple asymmetry. Some people are stronger on one side or have different sized arms or legs, but try as they might, and we're still trying these experiments, nobody has really figured out why 
we can't go straight. I've been curious about this for a while. So if you go back, and here's a beautiful example to the 1920s. So this is something we call a metaphor. My daughter Lydia, she was confused by metaphors. We said it's a word picture that describes things, but not literally. Well, that is the world. There is no point of reference. Now, I will freely admit, the world is a lot worse off than just walking around into circles, walking into things. It isn't a death spiral. Because of the fall, sin has entered the world. And with sin comes three major separations. Separation with God, separation with others, and separation with ourselves. All three of these things lead to a decline of culture. It has happened before. Something has happened to the intellectual aristocracy of antiquity that are walking about and talking at large ever since Socrates and Pythagoras. They began to betray to the world the fact they were walking in a circle and saying the same thing over and over again. Philosophy began to be a joke. It also began to be a bore. G.K. Chesterton in The Everlasting Man. There have been multiple falls of the West. I would argue that the largest one happened before Christ. You see, Delphi had won. The pagan culture had won against the best the world ever offered. Socrates was killed by his own people. Plato, the second smartest man, I would argue, in the world, his students became tyrants, chasing pleasure, power, or empty platitudes. The great earthly civilizations fell to evils. Alexander the Great, tyrant, decimated the Mediterranean, set up his own religion. The democratic experiment of Greece and Rome fell. An emperor ruled over the known world with an army that was unrivaled. Philosophy became paganism. The world was lost. There could be no science. If chaos rules everything, there can be no order. There could be no arts. How could there be art without transcendent hope? And there was no one to help others. Kindness was seen as a weakness, and love itself was a joke. If you heard the word, God loves you, you better run, because that's nothing you wanted to hear in Greek or Roman culture. The world did not need mere healing. It needed a resurrection. And yet, from a small backwater village, from a conquered and oppressed country, a baby was born in a manger. A prophecy given at the dawn of time realized this singular act changed the world. John wrote about this. In the beginning was the Word, the divine Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing that came into being has come into being. In him was life, and this life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You may have heard this verse multiple times. Verse 5, John says, the light shines in the darkness. Now, when John used that term light, it has a moral dimension to it. Jesus came as the incarnation of goodness. Later in the verse, 14, he says, full of grace and truth, both truth and beauty, grace, came as a full representation. Goodness, truth, beauty, incarnated into the God-man. Peter Kreeft wrote, goodness, truth, and beauty are the three things we all need we need absolutely, and we know that we need. Truth relates to the mind, goodness to the will or acts, and beauty to the heart, 
feelings, desires, or imagination. These are the only three things we will never get bored with or never will for all eternity because they are attributes of God and therefore all of God's creation, three transcendental or absolutely universal properties of all reality. Now what does that mean? Jesus is the fixed point, the ultimate act of all three, goodness, truth, and beauty culminating at the life of at the cross. This is the God-given solution to the problem of Plato's cave. We need someone to rescue us from the shadow lands, as C.S. Lewis would call it, and bring us into the real country. The church, as the bride of Christ, is the mirror of Jesus because we ought to reflect him in all of his goodness, truth, and beauty. Now, how do we do that? How do we do that and heal the world? We follow the greatest commandment. Jesus was asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. And the second is, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments depends the whole of law and the prophets. Look at Jesus the smartest person ever in the world, speaking truth to all, head. Lived a sinless life, demonstrated perfect goodness, healing those abandoned. Heart. And the humble act of coming to serve, not to be served. Hands. The unity of the head, the heart, and the hands is the unity of goodness, truth, and beauty. All in love. Let's dig a little deeper. I know it's chapel time. We actually have some interaction. You have five seconds. Talk to your neighbor. What is goodness? Go. Okay. So, sorry you can't share what you talked about, but it got you some thinking a little bit here. We know the verse, good teacher. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. Morality is not subjective. Goodness, we could define it as moral acts of the will. God is good, and because he is unchanging, we know good is unchanging. Now let's take a look at the church. Between 250 and 270 AD, a terrible plague believed to be measles or smallpox, devastated the Roman Empire. At its height, 5,000 people died every day in Rome alone. Christians were blamed, but there was an inconvenient fact. They stayed to care for the victims of the plague, while the city leaders and doctors fled. This happened a century earlier as well. Christians were noted of showing that taking care of the weak and dying was worth dying for. The early church, we know, was against slavery. It helped women and children in the communities. It established what we know today as human rights. They created hospitals, orphanages. Something very interesting, Rome itself was built on some laws called the Twelve Tables. The peasants revolted against the aristocracy and said, you need to write down some rules so you stop changing them. One of those rules was, every handicapped child must be put to death. We know that the early church opposed abortion and infanticide. So what did they do? They legally appealed to the Roman government in the midst of their persecution, not to stop their persecution, but to stop the killing of those innocent babies so that they could adopt them. Why did the early church do all this? Because all human beings have value, because we are all made in the image of God. Something shocking, Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist, said recently that Christianity should not be banished from society because it would give people a license to do very bad things. So, What do we do about this? Well, the Bible's pretty clear in James. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and does not bridle his tongue, 
He deceives his own heart. This man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. First Peter says, be hospitable to one another without complaint. So what is one of the major problems of the world? We would say is this pandemic of loneliness. Volunteering is down across the nation. People are worried about organizations that used to be filled with people helping. And yet activism is an all-time high. We as Christians need to be hospitable. Hardly anything is more characteristic of Christian love than hospitality. Through the ministry of hospitality, we share the things we value most. In other words, we share our lives. Alexander Strasch. Well, let's move on to the second transcendental truth. What is truth? Five seconds, go. Getting a little more tricky, isn't it? (laughs) Well, according to the correspondence theory of truth, truth is what corresponds to reality as it is. Now, all truth is God's truth. God created everything. You cannot have science or philosophy or any knowledge without a foundation, and that foundation is God. We know historically the church has made the university. We value knowledge and learning. The scientific revolution was started by Christians. Pascal, Newton, Kepler, Boyle, Galileo, just to name a few. What is science but merely thinking God's thoughts after him? Now, something interesting. The mind not the Bible, is the first line of defense God has given against error. If we do not use our minds properly, as God intended, the Bible will be no abuse to guard us from falsehood and protect us from evil. That's from Gregory Kokel. If we don't use our minds to properly, rightly divide the word of truth, things can be used out of context. Paul wrote this too, because there is no head, heart, or hand knowledge there is knowledge accurately and correctly applied that impacts our lives to move. Paul writes, for we, while we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, but our weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is Paul responding to false teacher accusations. He's referring to things that happen in the mind. Our war is waged in the battlefield of the mind. But the weapon of this war is the communication of the truth of God in love. Truth is a proposition of reality, but it also comes from the creator. God's truth is not subjective. I might say, I like chocolate chip mint ice cream. I also might say, this medication will save your life. These are two different statements. One is of a flavor, one is of a truth. You may say, well, I don't like chocolate chip mint ice cream, I like cookie dough ice cream. That's completely fine. But you can't say, well, I don't like this medication, it will not cure me, this water will cure me. Well, that's not true. Our goal with the truth is to be humble. It's not to kill with the truth, but to save captives. We were once captives of sin as well. We fight the fortresses Paul talks about, not people. Now, how do we know the truth? There are three major ways. Through special revelation, by studying God's word. Second one is prayer. Jesus, as the smartest man ever will ever be in this world, prioritized this discipline. We dare not do what he did all the time. Finally, in biblical community, we need to be humble and open to training, as well as training others in the truth. In Acts, you might know the story about a 
Apollos, who came to Ephesus. He was mighty in the scriptures, and he was instructed, but he only up knew to the baptism of John. Then Priscilla and Aquila heard him, took him aside, explained to him the way of God more accurately, then he wanted to go to Acacia. He greatly helped those who believed there because he powerfully refuted the Jews, demonstrated by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Open to instructing others in the truth and receptive to the truth. Finally, the third transcendental truth, what is beauty? Five seconds, go. Go. All right. Getting a little bit harder. Who was thinking beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Uh, No, not quite. I would define beauty as the God-given antidote to acedia. Beauty is not mere attractiveness or aesthetics, but is the antidote to acedia. What, What is acedia then? It's a medieval term that essentially means an inability to take joy in the things that should bring us joy. That we're sleepwalking spiritually. We're too busy to be busy. We're slothful. Why? Because we don't take joy in the things that we ought to take joy in. Have you ever been moved by nature? Looked at the mountains from a fire lookout tower or seen the beach (laughs) stretch out for miles? No one says, that's not beautiful. There's something there that transcends this that reflects to the creator. We are all sub-creators made in the image of God. You might know the story about the Inklings. Lewis, before he became a Christian, said that all myths were lies breathed through silver. But Tolkien would say, just as speech is an invention about objects and ideas, so myth is invention about truth. We have come from God, and inevitably the myths woven by us though they contain error, will reflect a splintered fragment of the true light, the eternal truth that is with God. Indeed, only by myth-making, only becoming a sub-creator, can man ascribe to the state of perfection that he knew before the fall. There's something called the Bach effect. A couple years ago, people from the Orient, China, and Japan would travel to Germany. Why? They were curious about the composer Bach very mathematical and precision in his music. But there was so much beauty in there as well. They had to know the person. And when they went to the places where he wrote his music and played his music, they saw that he dedicated every one of his musics to the glory of God. That is beauty. (sighs) Something interesting. Joseph Campbell, definitely not a Christian, said something profound. Our religious life is ethical, not mystical. The mystery is gone, and society is disintegrating as a result. C.S. Lewis did the same thing in The Voyage of the Dawn Trader when he had, a, even in your world, that is not what a star is, but only what it is made of. What should we do about beauty? We need to incorporate beauty in your life, in everything you do. Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, trustworthy. Philippians. Locate your life in the story of the gospel, which is the true and most attractive story. Finally, be filled with joy. Be an Orpheus, not an Oedipus. If you know the story of the sirens, you know that Oedipus would go by the sirens and he told his crew to plug their ears, tie him to the mast so he could listen to the siren call. And as they got near, he heard it and begged them to him be released. If they heard him, they would have gone to their doom. Orpheus, on the other hand, was a skilled musician, and when his ship drifted close to the island of the sirens, they sang out, ensorcelled the crew. But Orpheus pulled out his instrument and played music more beautiful that the crew heard his music instead and went to safety. That's how we should be. How then should we heal? To end up The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton. To sum up, because of Christ in the church, the sanity of the world was restored and the soul of man offered salvation by something which did indeed satisfy the two warring tendencies of the past, 
which had never been satisfied in full and most certainly never satisfied together. It meant the mythological search for romance, beauty, by being a story, and the philosophical search for truth by being a good and true story. Finally, in the Middle Ages, the church building was the largest and most decorated building. People knew where they were, that fixed point to the cathedral or church. Physically, so they wouldn't get lost. There also was a bell tower or a clock, but also a reminder of the architectural beauty, the messages of truth, and the goodness by the members. We need to become a living cathedral. How do we do that? By investing our life in worthwhile things, even if we never see the end result. Two, by living your life exhibiting the unity of goodness, truth, and beauty with a community of believers. And finally, love God. Love each other. This is what culturally saved the world and will always continue to heal the world and brings people to the source of this healing and salvation. Jesus, our Lord, the head of the church, and the source and sustainer of all things, good, true, and beautiful. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for coming to this earth. Thank you for coming, serving, and dying so we can become more like you. Help us to be good and true and beautiful, and that the world will see you shine from us. Amen.